What you're about to watch is a very personal story of friendship, art, the power of the internet, and finding your purpose in this world. This is the story of the most important album of my life. So that right there is me. My name is Harrison Renshaw, and a few years ago in 2017, I started a very significant journey. I was a sophomore in college, studying marketing, working part-time at a restaurant, and I really felt like I needed to do more. Whether it be music, movies, soccer, or whatever else, I've always been sort of obsessive about my passions in life. Deep down, I've known that I don't really feel like myself if I'm not expressing myself using these things. With this need for some kind of outlet, combined with a growing curiosity for writing and a deeply rooted love for YouTube, I finally made my own channel. At the time, I was extremely inspired by a wave of young, do-it-yourself musicians that were on the rise, and I decided that that was going to be my thing, giving quick little biographies of these artists, saying why I liked them, and why you should check them out too. I was watching Marvel's Luke Cage at the time, heard this quote, Always forward. Fell in love with this motto of always forward, and combining those two words is how I came up with my channel's name. Media just seemed like a decent word to encompass whatever nonsense I'd be doing. That niche subcategory of musicians that are blowing up but haven't quite made it to the mainstream yet seemed to resonate with people. Within a few months, I had a couple thousand subscribers, about a hundred thousand views, and I was on my way. Regardless of the fact that I was somehow speaking in a more boring, monotone voice than I am right now. A while back, my friend introduced me to one of the best up-and-coming acts in music. They're innovative, talented, a breath of fresh air. Time went on, I was juggling school and this newfound hobby, I was making all kinds of different music related videos at this point, I took the risk of having that be my full time job the summer of 2018, went back to school in the fall from my last semester, and in the winter of 2019, I found myself at a bit of a crossroads. I had graduated from college, drove 1400 miles away from home to live with one of my best friends on a farm in Missouri, don't ask why, and this was my big test for whether or not I could actually do this for a living. With all the pressure I was putting on myself, I sat down one night, really thought about what my goal was with Alpha Media and those aspects of music discovery and helping support musicians that deserve more of a spotlight came front and center. And that's when I texted my friend Chase. <laughs> And that's who this is. We went to high school together, he was a couple grades above me, we were friendly, not exactly friends, but I always thought he was a cool guy. Chase played in the jazz band, he made a couple mixtapes with ambient beats on them, we were both Kanye stands. we would do Spongebob impressions to each other in the hallway, whatever. A weird fun fact is that one time I got two Jay-Z Justin Timberlake tickets for my birthday, and even though we didn't hang out, Chase is who I invited along with me, he said yes, it was a great time, and here's him eating a burrito at Cadoba from that day with the caption, Ooh, kill him. Oh, kill him. Oh, kill him. Oh. He ended up moving on to the Berkeley College of Music, saxophone in hand, and he self released an album called Onion in 2016. Though I hadn't really spoken to Chase in a few years, I saw him post something about the album, and I immediately fell in love with it. It was this really fascinating jazz pop, a few surefire hits, some atmospheric stuff, there's something to love for everybody on there, and I couldn't get enough of it. However, like most self released albums in the age of the internet, nothing really happened happened with Onion. Friends and family supported Chase and knew the spark he had was special, but, you know. So, a few years after Onion Drops, I'm at this YouTube crossroads in rural Missouri. I had been recommending musicians that already had decent followings, trying to get them even more fans, but what if I went even deeper? I texted Chase, who probably had less than a thousand monthly listeners on Spotify at the time, told him that I wanted to talk about his album that I held near and dear to my heart, and he gave me his blessing. On March 29th, 2019, I uploaded the first installment of my series Great Songs You Might Not Know, where I talk about three different musicians and their songs that I think most people probably aren't familiar with. Onion was definitely the main topic of that episode. The two songs that I mentioned specifically were All I Want Is You, which is this mellow love song with a groovy bass line and some intoxicating horns. And thank god I found you, Chase's distorted, eerie, James Blake-esque cover of a bubbly Mariah Carey classic. Thank god I found you. 
With about 30,000 views on this video shortly after, I saw firsthand what kind of impact I could have on somebody, and best of all, it was a guy whose music I had loved and believed in for years, but nobody had been listening to. All I Want Is You got the biggest push. It was featured on some well-known Spotify playlists, it was on a trending playlist for a little while, and now Chase had 40,000 monthly listeners, which to us felt like a million. A few months later, after I moved back home from the farm, I hit up Chase and we made a live session of a few of his tracks. This was an oddly pivotal moment in this whole journey because this was one of the most beautiful nights of my life. I am so proud of what we made. I think the final product is great. Sun was shining up so brightly. But it absolutely bombed on YouTube. It is a punch in the gut when you think you have something special and for whatever reason, it doesn't catch on. But then I started thinking, this is probably how Chase has felt for years. He created something from absolutely nothing, a musical project that was a labor of love, and for a long time, nothing. Up until this point, the stuff that I was doing on YouTube was pretty inconsequential. I was trying to lift up voices that did not really need my help. For the first couple of years, I was just a kid living at my parents' house, talking about music that I liked, and over time, people started watching my stuff. But with the success of me helping Chase, and then the shock of this thing that I was actually a part of, this piece of art that felt personal to me, failing, I started to really battle with the ups and downs of this job. This wasn't just me aimlessly projecting onto others anymore with no repercussions. This channel, this idea, these goals became a substantial piece of me. January 2020, I finally moved out of my childhood home for good. I was on my own, and I see this era as me really starting to create, not because I got myself stuck into doing this. No, each video felt special. I wasn't making something because I needed to put out a video that week. Every topic was its own little passion project. Around this time, Chase and I started to hang out a lot, and it was more as friends and less as business colleagues. We were going to karaoke every weekend, and P.S., that man puts on a show singing Roy Orbison. Darling, what can I do? And at the end of one night, as we were sitting in a Burger King parking lot, his eyes lit up because he wanted to show me the new music he had been working on. One track was this retro soft rock that reminded me of something a band would play at prom in a 50s movie, and the other was this very catchy love song that had like jungle noises in it, like birds singing and stuff. He told me they were early demos, and while they were weird, I was excited for the future. That is until the apocalypse started, and I, along with many other people in the world, went into a deep depression. I'm not kidding, I watched 40 seasons of Survivor in 5 months. Let me repeat that, 40 seasons, like 15 45 minute episodes per season, in 5 months. You think a depressed person could make this? I took a break from YouTube, and that lack of productivity really got to me. It was this vicious cycle of being scared to go through with any of my ideas. Each day that I didn't put something out, I kept beating myself up. I was having this identity crisis where my output on YouTube was directly linked to my mental health and it was rough. While my confidence was at an all-time low, Chase was putting everything he had into this album that he had been working on. First, he sent me a rough demo of a song, and it was this paradoxical, depressing dance track. The kind of thing where the lyrics are super dark, but the song makes you want to get up and move. <laughs> Then he sent me a finished music video for that retro 50s prom song that he played for me at Burger King. There was a cuckoo clock, all these bizarre close-ups of Chase as he seemed to be following the title of the song, and losing his mind. <laughs> While I was interested in what he was showing me, I was not in a receptive place at that time. With me feeling so self-destructive, the idea of him doing these strange, ambitious songs and music videos did not seem like good business to me. But over that summer, Chase and I started getting pretty close. We were in each other's small COVID circles, hanging out when we could, and to be completely honest and transparent here, I credit him with getting me through that horrible time. Whenever I would go through a slump of no productivity and a lack of ideas seeming like the end of the world, he would remind me to roll with the punches. All the best breakthroughs happen after your lowest point. Stuff like that, and he was right. Simultaneously, we both got into a groove. He was finishing the album absolutely killing it, and in my opinion at least, I created some of the best videos that I've ever made from that point on. Stuff that I really cared about, that people responded to, I started showcasing smaller musicians in a new way, and hey, if I made something that I thought was amazing and no one else cared, 
We'll get him next time. However, I think I felt too good too soon, and in the late fall, I had the biggest mental breakdown of my life. To put a long story short, the years of anxiety and depression related to my time on YouTube came to a boiling point. I do not want to complain too much. I recognize the privilege I have doing what I do. The point is that I'm someone who's constantly overthinking everything in my life anyway, so I'm probably not the best candidate for the struggles and burnout that come with this job. Whenever I'm putting something out, I care about it. It's from the heart. It means something to me. So it's a slippery slope when you attach the YouTube algorithm to a very insecure person. Every commercial failure can feel like a dagger to my creative spirit. Every day when I'm sitting at my desk, mad at myself because I can't come up with an idea, it makes me think that this whole process, everything I've done, has been a waste of time. I don't need to get into the specifics, but I was at the lowest point in my life for about a week or so, complete isolation and spiraling constantly, and then I get a text from the guy that's been helping me so much, and he asks if I want to come over and listen to the final product of his new album, fear and love together. As I was driving over, the gravity of what I was about to experience really started to hit me. When it comes to myself and my YouTube channel, the original goal has always been to propel up-and-coming artists to new heights. For Chase, the goal has always been to create the most personal, important piece of art that he can, with the hopes that others can appreciate the work too. The album was done. It's finished. Everything leading up to this was our paths crossing perfectly in a way that I can only describe as destiny, and we were about to listen to the thing that is going to decide what happens from here on out. Am I going to be able to help the up-and-coming artist that seems most important to Alpha Media as a whole, and will people appreciate this project that means everything to Chase? Both of those things rely on the quality of the music itself. I sit down in his living room, we turn off the lights, get the iTunes visualizer going on the TV, speakers turned up as loud as they can go, and he hits play. I'm not only listening as a guy that likes music, I'm not just listening as a friend of Chase that wants to like the record because I'm so close with him, I'm also stuck in that business mode of knowing what he's capable of, that his talent deserves attention and success, and I'm praying that the album will feel marketable. And as that first song played, that part of me worried about whether or not this thing could be a hit started feeling droves of anxiety. The music was uncomfortable, challenging, bizarre, and I swear to you, in that moment, I seriously felt like I was going to pass out. I felt the weight of so desperately needing this to work out, and then the sounds of the opening track were so nerve-wracking that it brought me right back to the breakdown that I had been experiencing for the past week. You don't really hear isolating, existential breakdowns on the radio too often. The second and third songs play, and while they weren't as aggressive, they still kept me in a worried state of mind. In a world where catchy, repetitive one-liners get songs famous on TikTok after a 16-year-old girl does a dance to them, my hope of Chase's album flourishing was dwindling with every verse. With track 4, I was reminded why I love Chase's music. It was more of what I had been used to. While it wasn't a catchy pop song, it was some charming singer-songwriter stuff. But then the next song had a spoken word part halfway through, and that business side of me wanted to push back again. Charlie D'Amelio is not gonna do a TikTok dance to this poem. Number 6 and 7 had me feeling a similar back and forth, bits and pieces of the artistry that I had been telling all my friends and subscribers about for years, and then stuff that left me feeling confused and uneasy. The eighth song was the finished product of that paradoxical, depressing dance track that I mentioned earlier. This was the first time that night that I really started to lose myself in the music. With pulsating drums, a strong bass line, and captivating vocals from Chase, I was actually starting to feel what was playing instead of trying to critique it from some robotic, business person marketing standpoint. I was bopping back and forth, dancing around, eyes closed, and as the next song played, Played, it was this atmospheric interlude with just a synth and Chase slowly breathing out into space. Being that I was actually immersed into everything that I was hearing now, this two minutes of reflection within the album, in the music, completely took me out of my body and I felt like I was looking at myself from another lens. 
I promise I'm not usually this dramatic, but this was one of the most jaw-dropping moments of my life. It hit me in that moment that I could feel the anxiety-inducing roller coaster of my past few years in the story of this project, and it was matching up with my life in ways that are hard to even describe. As the interlude on the album played, the songs that I had just been listening to started flashing before my eyes, along with the memories that I've told you about so far. That nerve-wracking opening track brought me back to when I was in school and needed my own creative outlet. The next few songs reminded me of my early days on YouTube, unsure of myself, but trying to break through to something more. The singer-songwriter one was like me getting into a groove and taking the risk of going full-time. The dramatic song with spoken word was me identifying the themes of my channel and beginning that journey of trying to really help up-and-coming musicians. I had the ups and downs of Alpha Media over the years, the successes of my finest videos and the periods of depression in between, and this interlude of a curious synth and Chase's contemplative breathing, that was the exact moment that I was in at Chase's listening to the interlude. That was my breakthrough of understanding and self-reflection. I felt this otherworldly attachment to the narrative of the album that Chase had created. I saw the progress that I had been making with my mental health, its connection to the creative progress of my channel over the years, and so on. Everything fell perfectly into place within this moment, and I was ready to move on. In my life, I was ready to stop overthinking and worrying so much. I could actually start rolling with the punches. For a long time, I had been on the brink of this stuff. I wanted to say, oh, it's okay if a video doesn't do well, or it's fine if I don't have an idea this week, but I was always holding back. And also, right in that moment of me listening to this piece of art for the first time, I let go of that annoying part of me that wanted this album to be radio-friendly pop music that could get a billion streams. This new labor of love that Chase created was challenging. That intro was uncomfortable. The first half of the project that played did make me feel nervous fluctuations of ups and downs, but it was brilliant music. I was so hung up on each individual song getting onto Spotify playlists that its originality, the unique, bizarre nature of the songs, was holding me back from accepting how good it really was. And it's funny, right when I felt this weight off my shoulders and I was ready to kick back and enjoy myself, that that's what happened in the story of the album, too. Each song from then on out was stuff that I'd be bending over backwards to show everybody. The first half was Chase feeling apprehensive and he was struggling, so the songs reflected that. But once he reflects and has his eye-opening moment in the interlude, from then on out, he's feeling good and the music shows you that with hit after hit. Different blends of pop, jazz, singer-songwriter, R&B, and whatever else. Some stuff that was more dramatic and worthy of a sing-along, and some that I was getting up and dancing to like crazy in Chase's living room. I was overcome with so much emotion. It was this euphoric special moment where the music playing was so true and authentic to every new second that I was living. As the tracks kept playing with new stories and new emotions emerging into the spotlight, I knew that this was the most important album of my life. I have heard countless better albums. I have plenty that I would call my favorite before this one, but there's never been a project that has even come close to feeling as personal and relatable to my life as this one has. After the project finished, we started talking about it, I got to hear his perspective and what it means to him. Chase made Fear and Love Together as a story that begins with heartbreak and isolation. He wants the listener to feel as uncomfortable as he did during a certain time in his life. As you start to try to pick up the pieces and begin something new, there are always going to be highs and lows. The story of the album follows him on this journey of contemplation, misunderstanding his fears and wrongfully fighting against them, rumination, really experiencing those loads so that you can learn to live with them, and manifestation, breaking down your own walls and opening yourself up to love again so that you can eventually find true peace and happiness. Chase is obviously a big fan of storytelling, and he based this whole project on a a popular storytelling template, The Hero's Journey. I talked about this in a Kanye video I did one time, but The Hero's Journey is the basis for some of the most famous stories ever told. Our protagonist begins in the ordinary world, there's some kind of call to adventure that the hero eventually refuses, they get some kind of mentor, begin an adventure, they face challenges that really test them, and then they eventually have to encounter their most fearsome opposition yet. Once they're at their lowest point, they conquer that problem, get some kind of reward, begin their journey back to normalcy, there's a moment of consideration for this new life and abandoning the old, and then they come full circle and settle into this current, fulfilling state of being. That's how Chase decided to frame his album based on his own troubles with
with Love Lost and Finding Himself again, and it clearly resonated with me because I think it matched up pretty well with my story too. And now that I've told you our story, it's time to really go into detail about what's at the center of everything. After experiencing it over and over again, now with a much better understanding than that stressful first listen, this is my track-by-track -track rundown of what you're going to hear on Chase Segley's Fear and Love Together. Overture opens the album by dropping the listener right into Chase's feelings of loneliness and heartbreak. The lyrics are pretty frantic and nonsensical because he seems to just be listing out every thought that goes into his head. As the instrumental grows more and more chaotic, Chase's words follow suit. His thoughts are over overlapping on top of each other and it feels like you're spiraling out of control. The super fascinating thing is that these scattered words and phrases are from all across the album that you're about to hear. You obviously won't realize it the first time you're hearing it, but you're getting a huge glimpse into the full project within the opening song. I can't feel anything I want. Alive acts as the first call to adventure. Chase is criticizing the emotions that are holding him back, and he wishes he could start over, but that's easier said than done. I compare this one to those moments in Disney musicals where the main character is dreaming of a better life. I keep on running from my love. I keep on running from my life. Sonically, things are pretty stripped down during the verses, but the chorus introduces some reassuring horns that come across to me as a pat on the back or a warm hug. See I can see the Let Go interlude transitions that inviting sax from Feel Alive into a cold, distorted version of itself, with a voice in the background telling Chase to let go. It's a great representation of inner conflict, and it's like your conscience fighting off the demons in your head. Let go. Somehow Somewhere is the singer-songwriter track that I mentioned before. While Chase typically makes a lot of jazz pop, this is his take on folk music. Acoustic guitar, whistling, and a very confessional lyrics, but he stays true to his style by throwing in some electronic noises in the background. Within the narrative, this to me feels like Chase rejecting his call to adventure. It's him looking back to the past and questioning whether or not he's even capable of moving forward. The song as a whole is, again, him wishing for greener pastures, but it isn't very optimistic. Maybe somehow, somewhere. Back to Life is one of the quirkiest songs on the album, and I could talk about this one forever. We open with this very dramatic verse of Chase calling out for help and asking, is there anyone out there who can bring me back to life? With some nature sounds in the background and the instruments slowly making their way in one after another, this thing is super cinematic. Every time I hear it, I can see a potential music video in my head. At the end of the track, we get that spoken word piece that I talked about, and this is the advice that some kind of higher power gave to Chase. It's a description of how incredible love is, and how that's gotta be the end goal, but before you're able to get to that point, you have to experience fear in its purest form. Within the story, this is obviously Chase meeting his mentor. Because in the end, you will find true love. On Ghost, Chase crosses the threshold and really begins his adventure. This song and Somehow Somewhere seem to be tied together because musically we've got guitar and whistling, and lyrically there's some sort of discussion of Chase's past. However, this time, we're starting to see the light. There's finally some optimism. As I gaze up at the sun. This one probably has my favorite instrumental moment on the album with some soft keyboards getting hit by this charismatic sax line. Into the Woods is a short song that seems more thematic for the story of the album than anything. While it's not one of the songs that I see myself throwing on by itself, it very much has its place on Fear and Love together as a whole. If the album was a movie, this song comes across to me as the montage that plays when our hero is fully engulfed into the journey. These trials and tribulations are expressed through Chase singing I Will Find My Way to You with a mystifying atmosphere and some mysterious saxophone. <laughs> How Can I Keep From Singing is that pessimistic dance track that I've mentioned a couple times. With some intoxicating drums, keys, and synths, this is one of the songs on the album that you're gonna want to play as loud as you can. It absolutely rips. <laughs> Lyrically and thematically, this is Chase at his lowest point. 
He's pleading that someone saves him from the anguish that he's currently feeling, but he's also still in a place where he's rejecting the thing that put him on this journey in the first place, love. Keep from Intermezzo is that point in the album that made me have my big revelation. It's a two minute intermission for the album with these eerie synths and Chase's breathing, which narratively represents him reflecting on his journey thus far. If there was ever a moment to change his path, it would be right now. <laughs> Losing My Mind was the first single for the album, and it's the most crucial turning point in the story. Personally, I feel like this and How Can I Keep From Singing are both Chase at his lowest point, but one is Chase getting to that horrible space and beginning to ask questions, and this song is him attempting to break free of it. This was the retro 50s prom song that he played for me in the car at Burger King over a year ago, and it's such a cool feeling seeing it work so well in the context of the album. Through these massive horns and Chase's most explosive vocal performance on the record, it sounds like he's really losing his mind, but in a good way. This is the supreme ordeal. <laughs> There's no more holding back. We started in a horrible, lonely place. We've been on a tumultuous journey. We have lived through true fear, and now we're ready to open up and try to experience true love. I Can Be is this ultra-sweet song about believing in yourself, and this is Chase's first taste of a new life. We've got some deliciously cheesy lyrics to reflect those ideas, some very uplifting piano and drums, and in general, it's the complete opposite of the darkest points on the album. I think this one and the folky somehow somewhere are like two sides of the same coin. They're both about the possibilities of moving forward, but somehow somewhere was chased during a state of fear. He didn't actually believe he could reach the goals in that song, but I can be is chased during a state of love. This is him truly trusting in himself that he can do and be anything he wants. Coming down is Chase coming down after that pure, unadulterated bliss on I Can Be. Don't worry, we're still in a good place. He's just being more realistic about the new journey at hand. Love is not something that's going to come easy, so we can't expect everything to be perfect. This song is pretty mellow, but it's something that you can really bop your head back and forth to and lose yourself in. This is one of the many examples why I love Chase's percussion within his music. He's not afraid to really go for it and use stuff that sounds digital and manufactured. The drums combined with everything else yields an aesthetic that brings nostalgia and some elements of the future. Fix These Broken Eyes is literally a 10 out of 10 perfect song in my opinion. This is his dramatic theatrical moment in the spotlight, and finally, after all this time, he's putting himself out there romantically again. He's opened his heart back up, and this is the road to a new love. To fix these broken eyes and take me home. Right after this song played when we were listening, Chase joked that this was his dedication to Meatloaf, and you can really hear that in the music. It's so grand, so striking, and in my opinion, this is the culmination of everything you've heard so far. The whole album has been building up to this, and it really feels that way near the end of the track. Give Myself to You is a continuation of Chase's proposal from the previous song. He's opened himself up to love, and this is the solidification that it's a real thing, that it's actually going to happen. With an enchanting, very dreamlike atmosphere, we are so far away from the loneliness and anxiety from before. Within the hero's journey, this is Chase's resurrection. He's almost home, and the new life of love is about to begin. <laughs> The album ends with the second single, By Your Side, which is probably the most quote-unquote accessible thing on the project. It's a groovy, R&B-inspired love song that you can dance and sing along to, and do you know what? If Charlie D'Amelio is gonna make a TikTok to anything on Fear and Love, it's gonna be this one. 
Chase's vocals are great, the saxophone in this gets me every time, and I'll probably spend the next year of my life recommending this to everyone I know. While that is supposed to be the closing song on the album, Chase wanted a bonus track at the end so we get a curtain call of silence for a little bit, and then the surprise song Baby. This is actually the other one Chase played for me in the car at Burger King, the song with the jungle noises in it and whatnot, and it is so fun. While we already got the full narrative of Fear and Love together, this is like a scene that plays after the credits or something. It's definitely a part of the same story, but it's a quick glimpse into Chase's new, serene, love-filled life. For anyone curious, this is a ranking of my favorite songs on the record, but remember, Fear and Love Together is very conceptual. It works best when you listen all the way through, but I'm not gonna blame you if you wanna add a few of these to your playlist or something. And I need you to understand how much time and effort went into this project. I could make an entirely new video showing all the different connections from one song to another, how bits and pieces of the album touch on what's already in Chase's discography, and so on, but I'll just give you a few of my favorite fun facts. So I described how in the opening song Overture, you're basically getting a summary of the whole album because you'll hear phrases in that one song from all across the record. One of the coolest things is that the ending vocal section is don't speak, love speaks, let love speak for everything we need, we want, and it sounds like it's coming from a higher power that's gonna lead Chase on his adventure. Don't speak, love speak. Well, on Give Myself to You, after Chase has fully realized that message, now he's the one saying it because that's what he learned along the way. Also, in Overture, Chase says, I feel nothing. He's alone and heartbroken. I feel nothing. But by the end of the album on By Your Side, something really interesting is that he says, I won't stay far away from me. Stay far away from me. The song is obviously about supporting this new lover and being by their side, but this journey has also taught him to stick by his own side and treat himself better too. I feel nothing to I won't stay far away from me is a big jump. One fun little thing is how the album is broken down. We've already talked about how strong the narrative is and how theatrical and dramatic the music can be, and I think it's cool that we get theater terms like Overture, Intermezzo, and Curtain Call to split the album into different parts. And the most mind-blowing fun fact of all of this revolves around my number one favorite song on Fear and Love, Fix These Broken Eyes. So I think the melodies here are top notch, specifically when he first says the title of the song, to fix these broken eyes and take me home. And then that huge release when he's singing Fear and Love together. But when I first heard this track during our listening party, both of those pieces sounded oddly familiar. I talked to Chase about it once the album was over, and he explained to me that I 100% have heard them before on his demo tape, Provisional Pop Songs, from four years ago. This is a strange little EP that he dropped that consists of two long tracks, but within them, there are a bunch of really short, unfinished ideas that he had been workshopping at the time. At one point, we have Chase literally saying, why can't I write a song? Because he was having trouble figuring out the lyrics to this melody. Why can't I write a song? And then we have this saxophone bit that will probably ring a bell. When he explained that to me, that he's technically been working on this one song for over four years and he has a bunch of similar situations like that, that was all the reassurance I needed for my new journey that I was ready to start. You see, this is precisely why Fear and Love Together felt so applicable to me. Between starting my YouTube channel, seeing a ton of ups and downs, trying to discover what my purpose is with this platform that I'm so lucky to have, coming to terms with the fact that doing something creative for a living can be a very slippery slope, and all the anxiety and depression that has come with this adventure, I've needed to learn to roll with the punches. Like Chase learned on his own journey, and as you can hear within his beautiful, fantastic, moving album, if you work hard, have faith in yourself, and trust the process, everything's gonna work out in one way or another. That business part of me that was so scared and intimidated by the challenging, non-easy listening songs at the beginning of the album, I'm so far beyond that now. Obviously, I want the project to do well, and I think it's great, don't get me wrong, 
but the most important thing is that he made what he wanted to make. He wasn't catering to anyone or anything, and that's exactly what he should be doing. And following that same logic, there's no need for me to worry so much. If I don't have an idea, I don't have an idea. If a video doesn't do well, we'll get him next time. But most importantly, when it comes to me trying to capture a perfect representation of my purpose and what I'm here on this earth for, it's fine if it takes me a while to figure that out, or if it changes over time, and so on. In the same way that this album is the culmination of everything Chase has made up until this point, this video feels like that for me. This is a new chapter, a new understanding, and I can't wait to see what happens from here. All I know right now is that one of my best friends in the world made an album that is not only super high quality, but it really helped me. And hey, to anyone out there that might be watching this right now, I think it could help you too.